We are honored to present this deeply moving and inspiring episode of Conversations with Jillian with Dr. Damon Dagnon. He shares with viewers a very personal story of heartbreak and explains that even in the most vulnerable of moments, we can find meaningful connections. These connections in our personal lives can help us learn and grow as people and as physicians. Jillian and Damon also talk about how finding what gives you a sense of fulfillment, both at work and outside of it, is key for building resilience. Lastly, the discussion sheds light on the growing importance of health humanities. Exploring this interdisciplinary field of study, clinicians are given the opportunity to reflect inwardly and consider what it means to be human in the context of healthcare delivery. As a reminder for our members, these interviews are supplemented by additional learning to support your wellness, and they are eligible for Section 3 MOC credits. Please read below for more details. I hope you enjoy watching this interview, and I invite you to take a look at the other conversations with Jillian in this series. So Damon, I want to start by asking you if you could tell me how you ended up pursuing a career in medicine. Well, how much time we got. Um, I, you know, I, I think the most obvious is um, the most obvious start to the answer is is my dad. Uh, my mom and dad are in healthcare. My mom trained uh, at St. Mike's in Toronto in nursing. And my dad trained at Queen's University and then did his internship uh, in Saskatchewan uh, in medicine and then came back to Queen's in 1970, a few years before I was born, to do emergency medicine when emergency medicine really wasn't a specialty. Um, and that, that weighed heavily growing up, hanging out with my dad at the hospital, driving to work, seeing patients. He used, when I was little, he used to come home and say he saw Ernie and Bert at work again that day, and we, he would make up stories. And, and, and really, I learned when I was little how special it was to care for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think growing up, um, you know, I was interested in a lot of different things. I certainly liked the human body, uh, uh, very active sports and extracurriculars. A lot of people told me what I was going to be when I grew up, which kind of bothered me. <laughs> they were right, it turns out, because um, I ended up here at Queen's University doing emergency medicine and um, being active in medical education and a number of different things. So uh, my mom, I would say from my mom's training, um, she in some ways, I think now when I reflect back, continues to have maybe a more powerful influence on me and how I approach mm. patients one at a time within the emergency department. And I have ongoing active discussions with her. Um, and what makes her proud is, is, you know, hearing that I cared for somebody um, and that I was kind and compassionate and uh, it was never, yeah. And so uh, certainly there are other influences, but th those were the two big ones for sure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Beeman, one of the things we're going to talk about today is mm -hmm. when you were a resident, your young son received mm -hmm. a horrible diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you, if we could start by talking a bit about those years, what that was like for you to be a resident physician in emergency medicine with a toddler who had just been diagnosed with cancer. Um, so it was too much too much for anybody at, at any point in time. Um, it was the end of fourth year of my five years of residency um, when Callum was diagnosed. Um, and I knew from medical school, even though I didn't think I'd be a neurosurgeon, but I, I had interests in pediatrics and, and I, I, I kind of, I knew immediately within that first second when I heard the word brain tumor or the term brain tumor, 
um, that there was a good chance that we were gonna lose the battle. Um, and so then we, we had six months of surgery, chemotherapy, stem cell transplants and so much more. And so I took a pause in my training. Um, and then Callum died of complications from the, the protocol, which, which were predictable complications. We, we um, Trisha and I, my wife, Trisha, uh, about a month after he was diagnosed and after his surgery and we sat down with the team and they kind of laid out the path. And we very quickly within, you know, that hour that we were together with the team realized that we were far more scared of the treatment protocol than we were of the tumor. Um, you know, when you have two super shitty options, I was gonna say crappy, but super shitty options, yeah. um, you really only have crummy options left. And, and, so, and so we embarked on that. And, and as I started my answer, you know, it's too much. Like it's, it's yeah. too much to this day to sort of try and manage that, uh, yeah. but uh, that's the way life is. And um, that was now almost, well, 16 years ago that we were at yeah. Kids. Mm -hmm. Now, th these are some of the worst imaginable ways. In fact, I think your story is really the worst imaginable way for us to learn about what it's like to be a patient or to be a family member of a patient. But I wonder if you could talk about how some of those experiences shaped the kind of physician that you are today, whose eyes you tend to see things from as a result of what your family went through and what Callum went through. Well, there's there's a lot there. Um, I think just the magnitude of emotion, the vulnerability, the no privacy, like that that's something I could spend a couple hours <laughs> chatting with you about. Just just feeling that and, and experiencing that. Um, I think, you know, role models um, and people who are there and showed up time and time again. And I think particularly when it was hard to show up, when yeah. we, we often think within, you know, talk within medicine, we're both physicians, you know, we're used to having answers. We're used mm -hmm. to knowing how to fix things. We're used to things being kind of, um, let's say more binary you know, one direction or the other, when the reality is there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity, a lot of um, unknowns. Mm -hmm. And, I th you know, thinking of the question that you asked me, I think that's a really big part of just the complexity of it all. And when um, the times early on, Partway through and, and at the end when we were in the ICU, the some of the moments that really impacted me the most were when people from the team, social workers, mm -hmm. nurses, RTs, you know, certainly some of the, the physicians just stood there with us, just mm -hmm. came to see us. It wasn't about the medicine, it was about sharing that tragic experience with us. Um, yeah. and just being sharing them sharing the moment as much as they could of just trying to live in the moment with us mm -hmm. um without solution without um a pat on the back to make it better just mm -hmm. and, and that that to me i think was and, and i can think of multiple times certainly towards the end but even along the way that mm -hmm. um i think taught me that being a physician or other healthcare worker, but having a therapeutic alliance with a patient isn't, it's often not about the medicine or the surgery, or it's, it's about having a connection mm -hmm. and um, being together with whatever that sort of path is. And, and so that's had a huge influence on me. And I, I can't say that I bring that to every patient care interaction, but it, it's something that I reflect on a lot. And, try in the ways that I can to integrate that uh, into my practice. You and I have talked in other settings about 
professionalism and the connotations that that word sometimes has, how it's interpreted, especially by residents and medical students sort of trying to figure out what their professional identity is as it forms. And I wonder if you could just talk for a moment about your thoughts around this question of when something horrific happens to us in our personal lives, when we lose, you know, I mean, the loss of a child is clearly, I think everyone agrees, the most unique type of loss, one of the most difficult losses there is to recover from. And getting medicine, what we so often do is our own experiences, our own bereavement, tragedies, traumas, they get pushed aside. They're not sort of brought to the table. And I wonder what some of your experiences have been, Damon, or what some of your thoughts are also as an educator in terms of how that experience shows up in your clinical life and your teaching life on a regular basis. So I think a couple of things I pick up on on that question um, is one is, you know, recovery. Um, re- recovery is continuous. And, and I think we all know that rationally, but like emotionally and psychologically, it, it, it just, you know, if you think of the impact that your family and, and your sisters had on you and how that, mm-hmm. that is with you forever and you want it to be with you as, mm-hmm. as hard as some of the memories might be, you know, I think that's one thing is that it, it's kind of continuous and it's always there and, and that's, mm-hmm. that's okay. It's how you kind of manage those memories and how you function with it. I think we have um, some maladaptive behaviors when it comes to how we look at professionalism. You know, I agree with all of the outward facing can manage roles um, to care for others, patients and families. But I think we're, and you know, never mind COVID, pre-COVID, and then add in COVID. But I think we have a hard time looking inwardly to say, how can we do all this? Because because we pride ourselves for right or wrongly, sort of maladaptively to be fixers. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard, it's almost easier in a way to care for others and not think about yourself and your own self-care. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm a shift worker. I work, uh, in the emergency room. I work nights, weekends, holidays. I take great pride that I do. I do trauma call. I do recess call. And so, you know, my fa- my immediate children and my, uh, wife are really the only ones who give me trouble about not getting enough sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody else kind of celebrates it that, wow, look at all that you do on way less sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I, I think within our culture and our system, like the more you give that's celebrated that much more and whatever that does to our ego and how we sort of sh- shape norms and, and, you know, go about our daily lives, I think is very powerful over time. You know, I, I've heard you um, within your book, write About sort of accumulated trauma. I think we have accumulated like maladaptive behaviors or mm-hmm. ways that we kind of shape the mindset of how we approach practice and whether you you know whether it's sacrifice or not some of it's sacrifice and some of it really feels good to our ego to help other people I mean that's why we got into it yeah so then taking that forward about um well six or six or seven years after Callum died Trish and I uh talked about maybe writing a book um, as much for ourselves and our family and some other bereaved parents just to kind of write our story down while it was mm-hmm. some of those bittersweet moments were fresh in our mind and some of those experiences. And so what I realized over the, the sort of four or five year process of going about writing the book and and then putting it out into the world was that sort of sharing that vulnerability mm-hmm. um, around the same time somebody turned me on to Brene Brown's work and some mm-hmm. other work. And, and that really, I think, lit a little bit of a fire inside of me to, because I, I, I mean, when Callum was diagnosed, I was already exposed to the world. Like, mm-hmm. there's that dad whose son has a brain tumor at sick kids. Yeah. There's that doctor who's a resident who's come back to work. Yeah. Who's lost his child. Um, there's that doctor, dad, husband at the grocery store with, you know, two of his three kids. 
Mm-hmm. And so that exposure was already there. So, um, and the book added more exposure because more stories together, more about us. Um, that I realized from a role modeling point of view, role modeling vulnerability. And as Brene Brown would say, I'm kind of stealing this from her, you know, this kind of strength that you have to have to explicitly and consciously put it out there and say, Mm -hmm. I'm putting this out there (laughs) and I feel nervous and vulnerable. Yeah. But part of the reason I'm doing it is I'm, I'm going to do it Mm -hmm. because I want to. And how much more exposed can I actually be? And maybe this will be helpful and maybe some people will reach out to me. Yeah. And so following that in the the years that have followed, I have realized that it's super gratifying to have conversations with others. And and you would be one of these people that I've had some, I think, you know, we, we got met through, we introduced through a colleague and kind of quickly sort of were fairly in sync talking about a number of subjects. And so as a medical educator uh, and spending a lot of time thinking about medical education um, within my practice, it has, um, I think, taken on more than I ever thought it would have. And it really, it's not about me. It's, it's really evolved to how can I become a facilitator? How can I facilitate bringing people together and having conversations? And if I have to go first, or if I have to share a little bit to get other people to share, no problem. Yeah. Let me let me start. I'm not going to ask of others what I wouldn't sort of share yeah. myself. And everybody has different stories and different challenges. Mm-hmm. And, and um, uh, you know, even if it's what we'll call a smaller challenge, it's still challenging in the moment and in the time. And and uh, I have lots of supports to sort of pick me back up off the ground. And, and I'm a pretty stubborn SOB. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I, once I get an idea in my head of what I think I want to try to achieve, I, I try very hard to make it happen. One of the th- things that you said there that I, I think is just so important to dwell on is this idea that, you know, so often the things that we're going through, whether they're, you know, on the 10 out of 10 on the spectrum, Mm -hmm. or just something difficult that we're experiencing, that's maybe Mm -hmm. three or four out of 10. I mean, sometimes we carry those things privately. But as you said, when the more dramatic or um, extreme the challenge that we're facing in our life is, the more likely that other people know about it. So we have this sense that we're going through it alone. But, you know, when there's been, as you say, some catastrophic loss or a family member who died in an accident or or just something that everybody knows about anyway, you know, very often we have this sense of it being experienced privately, but it's bridging that Mm -hmm. gap, as you say, between there's almost a piece of like restoring a locus of control and saying people know this anyway. So yeah. now, you know, I can be the one to open the door to make it possible for there to be a conversation mm-hmm. about it. I mean, I, I just love yeah. the way that you frame that because I don't think we do that often enough. And it has a profound permissive effect on other yeah. people's grief. I think, you know, as, as I hear you say that, Jill, like two things. One, one is, you know, when there's a big thing that happens, people are there for, you know, a short acute period of time and then people go back to their regular life and and that that can hurt right but yeah. you realize that that's that's just life people have yeah. their life and they can only support for so long um and then the other thing is you know i, I think we're it, me included can all be very prideful that if it's not the six seven eight nine out of ten mm-hmm. problem if it's just the point five or one out of ten problem um oh i won't i won't share that oh other people are dealing with that and and doing a better job and and so you know we have this sort of pridefulness or our our own ego of oh i don't know if i want to be vulnerable with that and um and and you know training can sometimes be quite isolating and not you kind of lose the shininess of the rest mm-hmm. of the world because you're just stuck in the hospital or clinic or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of people that could support you, that want to support you, that 
you're maybe not connected with. Um, and certainly COVID saw us, you know, disconnected a fair bit and struggling to have connections again and how different trainees and colleagues coped, I think was quite variable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there are a couple of different things that your comments make me think of. And one is that kind of, you know, the toxic altruism or mm-hmm. altruism when it goes from, you know, adaptive for your community and adaptive for you too, because it fuels your yeah. meaning and purpose mm-hmm. to maladaptive because it now there's this piece where it's sort of fueling your ego and your identity as yeah. the most altruistic, et cetera. I wonder how you've navigated and some of your own work conversations, your work even as an educator, helping people delineate motivation when it comes to altruism, helping them to dig a little bit deeper into that, or even how you've explored that yourself? Um, you know, so let, let me put a disclaimer forward. I, <laughs> I have not solved it for myself. <laughs> um, you know, I, I still like external rewards, like whether it's an award or, or some, some type of, um, yeah, some type of reward or acknowledgement. I, I think before, so after when we lost Callum and I um, was deciding whether I was thought I was strong enough to even come back to medicine um, and that sort of, I'll say it sort of rebuilding phase where, mm-hmm. where leaving medicine was an option. Mm-hmm. Um, and Trisha saying to me, well, you know, we can, cause she, we had been together um, for many years before um, and growing up together and she said, well, if we have to start over, then, you know, we, we start over together and we'll, we'll figure it mm-hmm. out. And so I think being able to know that I could leave medicine, mm-hmm. like there can, nothing would be harder than what we were going through with our loss. That then created a period of rebuilding of what do I want to bring back? Certainly I had to come back to clinical and we look, finish off my clinical training and and get comfortable in that environment again. But within my pursuits of medical education and simulation and team training and the different things, um, I feel like I might've had a little more space for a little more choice early on. Mm -hmm. Because when you graduate and you start a new career, everybody says, don't say yes too often, but a million people come at you to to get you interested in their stuff. I I think I might've had a little bit more space and was, a little more conscious to say, I I just, I I don't know that I can manage another project yet. And, Mm. you know, 15 years later, I, (laughs) um, I've gotten pretty good at juggling multiple uh, balls. Um, But I, I think what I say to other people getting back at your question is, you got to know you, and you, you got to know you, you have to know what you truly enjoy. Nobody paid you for it. Nobody said you had to do it. You just roll out of bed and it's like, oh, I'll spend three, four hours at this, no problem. You got to know the things that you feel that way. Hmm. Everybody has to have multiple support people. And for me, you know, the last thing is, you know, I have a life partner, a spouse who knows me well. I have siblings and parents and friends who know me well and can call me on my BS, you know, when I kind of have a plan and this is what's going to happen. And they're like, yeah, let's poke some holes in that plan. That's let's bring you sort of down a little bit. And I mean, I banter back and forth with them, but people who know you well, that you, you can't pull the wool, you know, the wool over their eyes. um, I, I think it's important for us because we're pretty confident smart people, those of us in, in healthcare, um, mm-hmm. you know, with what we do, whether it's medicine or nursing or, you know, rehab or social work, you know, we, we're pretty accomplished and, mm-hmm. and can accomplish what we set out to. The trouble mm-hmm. is we probably try to accomplish too many things. And that award that a colleague is getting for going above and beyond, mm-hmm. well, that person's going above and beyond. What's wrong with me? I'm just yeah. trying to like, manage the day to day and I'm not at that level and how can I be struggling and oh yeah. can I say that out can I say that out loud? Yeah. Um you know we we pick demanding professions. You're in <laughs> internal medicine, I'm in emergency medicine and I think we forget sometimes we pick jobs that 
have a fair bit of stress and demand yeah. a lot of us. And, and so for me, um, I have to be put together somewhat to be able to go and then to work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, I think that's a combination of a lot of things for each of us individually, like what makes us tick, what makes us happy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, if it's token things, modules and other stuff and whatever, then it's, uh, you know, we're in a tough space right now of trying to figure out with a crumbling system, <laughs> how, how we support each other um, yeah. and, and how I look at myself and go, okay, what's my responsibility? And yeah. where, where do I have personal agency to say, no, not doing that. <laughs> or I'm going to do that, which is a lot of work because I, because I'm yearning to do that work. Yeah. Like it, it just, it fills me up. Yeah, and, and so you know you have stuff you have to do, stuff you want to do, and then the stuff that fills you up. And so the, this is kind of long-winded answer, getting after some of the things when I talk with mm -hmm. junior colleagues or trainees um, about knowing yourself. And yeah, there's going to be challenges you see coming, and, and others that you don't. Um, but you got to keep those feet moving forward. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question, but I want to ask it with a disclaimer first. So I want to ask what you personally find restorative, but then let me put the disclaimer in there, because I think too often when we have these conversations, what we leave, especially, you know, early career folks, residents, they listen to the conversation and they think, okay, I need to have a great strategy to support my own personal resilience. And we do need to have those strategies, but the disclaimer before I ask you to answer that question mm -hmm. is alludes to what you already said. The system mm -hmm. is crumbling and the primary stressor on all of our resilience, our health, our well-being is the system dysfunction that, you know, every day we're confronted with the inefficiencies of practice and the problems with our culture. So I just want to get that in there so that we don't, uh, the minute yeah. people hear that, they don't unplug and go, oh, great. I mean, it's in the context of a crumbling system. What do you find um, are, are some of the things that you, over the years, especially with what you've dealt with on a personal level, Damon, have have kept you going? Um, so I'll start with my work family, my work community, the uh, emergency department, um just all of it from every single person who works there contributes to care along with the patients like that's that's <laughs> it's my second home and and you know my family that is there amongst the team and how we interact with each other and support each other and, and listen you know i certainly reap the benefit of their support when I came back in those early years and, and to this day. But I, you know, there came a time where I was quite happy and told them, like, tell me some of your little one out of 10 troubles. Like, let me, mm -hmm. let me kind of come back to be a sort of full member of the group in that way, sort of emotionally mm -hmm. and psychologically supporting people. But I, my, my, my mom, when she was an emerge nurse and very much would talk about like, these are the people you spend a huge chunk of your life with and have um, care for sick and well patients and others. And, and so I, I think having that and, and really like, you know, those little side conversations, oh, you got a, you got a haircut or your nails are done or tell me about how's your son doing first year of university, you know, just kind of in between patients. Um, or sometimes on night shifts in the olden days, we used to be able to have a little bit of downtime to talk a bit more. Now with our system, with COVID, with our human resource struggles, it, it, it's really hard to have even those smallest little bit. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's a hug or I'll joke with them like, here, you know, a, a free, like <laughs> you gotta let something out, a shoulder or here, you know, <laughs> and, and we kind of joke and, and, you know, we sort of debrief with each other. We, we keep our eyes open to see who's struggling today a bit more 
and just kind of like reach out. And if I'm not the right person to reach out, I might connect with somebody else to reach out to that person. And, and again, these are all different members of, of the team. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. So that, so that's really important. Um, I think, you know, I have a, a partner in life that um, we've been through so much together mm. that, you know, she is certainly my, the foundation uh, of my support system along with my, my kids. Um, my kids are 14 and 20 and I lean on them for support and talk to them about some tough stuff, get there, see how they feel. I think personally, like what, what, helps me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I like being outside in the sun and sweating and I like to sort of work out. I like pine trees. I like nature. Um, I grew up, went to Catholic school. I would say that I'm much more sort of spiritual and a person of the earth. Um, sunlight and trees uh, really help. Endorphins are a great natural drug. I, I like to benefit from endorphins, uh, from exercises when I can, you know, and then there's other stuff. Certainly I, I realize, like socially, I don't always get to sort of see my friends or talk with others. It's always people at work. Um, but I think the, uh, like the, these are all sort of positive active things. Mm -hmm. I think also when I said before talking about like knowing myself, knowing when mm -hmm. I'm, my heart rate is starting to, you know be elevated over sort of days or weeks mm -hmm. knowing when there is something I probably should talk about either with Trisha or with my family like reach out to my siblings or my parents mm -hmm. knowing you know I joke about how many balls I like to juggle um but knowing when okay I gotta sit down and plan which ones I'm gonna drop um when and how like I kind of get that feeling of oh I'm I'm more than maxed out um and then I think the other thing as I get older, and you can see there's more white hair here, I think, you know, got to walk the walk. So if we talk, if I talk about personal agency, if I talk about having boundaries, having limits, I have to be able to say, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to run out into the waiting room to try and see patients um, when I can't care for them properly. And it's actually dangerous and I will go yeah. home. And so I, I have to adjust how I care for patients in hallways, how I order. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason why emergency doctors are made fun of for ordering so many CAT scans. <laughs> <laughs> because we have to be safe. And if we can't yeah. see patients in the way that we normally do. So I, you know, I, I, I alter my practice pattern a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so many ways. And I, I think part of it is just an exploration mm -hmm. of you know, yourself as an in individual, your department, sort of immediate clinical environment, and then realizing that the system where we're at right now, we, we're in a really tough spot, mm -hmm. um, human resources, politically, uh, you know, uh, so many things that, you know, what is my part today? And sometimes my part is seeing patients and just trying to have that connection with them and that therapeutic alliance and um, not worrying about the other stuff and realizing mm -hmm. that I can only do so much. Mm -hmm. um, and even if that little bit is something that's worthwhile, um, I don't have to fix the entire system and my mm -hmm. ego shouldn't think that I mm -hmm. can. There's much more capable people. Yeah, um, That kind of helps. Uh, and then recovery and taking like chunks of time off, I, I think mm -hmm. I'm not very good at. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and I think we all have felt some guilt too within the last few years of yeah. totally turning off because as other colleagues get COVID or, or stuff comes up, you know, we want to fill the gap. And I, yeah. I think our families have suffered the consequence of that more than a mm -hmm. few times mm -hmm. the last few years. Mm -hmm. And the system, of course, relies on those instincts, right? To will exploit them till the bitter end. And this is one of the and, challenges and, that we grapple with is where, yeah. where do you... And then positively yeah. reward as yes. well. And it's, yes. It's, um, yeah, 
yeah, yeah. it's not uh, it's not simple, easy, fixable yeah. problems. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, you should at the end of the day, even if it's stressful, you should feel like what you do matters and that um, that you're having some impact because that's the internal stuff mm-hmm. that will keep your cup full even when COVID is trying to, <laughs> to drain mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, if I take the metaphor one step further. Yeah. yeah. Well, a couple of things that you said really sort of strike me. And if we think of, again, I often think of um, residents listening to these podcasts, mm-hmm. folks who are really in that um, uh, professional identity formation, you know, still in that stage of their lives more so than the rest of us. And a couple of things. I mean, one, you talked right at the beginning about that work family, building that relationship, the small interactions. Hey, you got a haircut, you know, how is your dog? What's your, that new dog that you got? How's it doing? And, you know, when, when we think about our own fulfillment at work and we look at the professional slice of that, you know, our, um, or, or rather the personal piece of that, the personal component. I mean, that's where we often localize that, the social net that we have, all the things you talked about, the the strong and deep relationships with siblings and family and spouses and community. But it's interesting, what I just find myself thinking about when you talk about that is how that other piece, you know, the culture of wellness that we require in order to experience personal fulfillment is also relationship driven. It's also about what it feels like to work where we work. And sometimes Mm -hmm. we work in really toxic workplaces where what we do can't overcome that. Or other times Mm -hmm. people experience misogyny, racism, ableism, Mm -hmm. homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera, things that they cannot overcome with those types of interactions. So I just want to be really clear about that, that it's not incumbent on the individual to fix those problems. But when those factors are not at play, you know, I think we sometimes forget how our behavior and relationships, those small efforts, how they pay dividends down mm-hmm. the road, right? Because they translate into that culture piece. And I think it's just the mm-hmm. way you frame that. It's such a great example of how when we think about wellness and our own professional fulfillment, we really do have to begin to think about in again, psychologically safe environments, not talking mm-hmm. about psychologically unsafe mm-hmm. environments, mm-hmm. W- what we can do to enhance that um, culture and those small things as really having a profound cumulative effect. That's really great here when you talk about that. I think so. And I think like in the environment where I work and sort of the the skill set that I'm able to use, you know, com- that combined with you know, a resuscitation in the middle of the night and, you know, you find yourself at two in the morning, you have five to 10 minutes to have a quick debrief in the recess room after a patient's gone up to the ICU and, and having all members of the team in there with trainees and students. And, and, you know, I, I, I love being able to say, okay, now let's talk about what happened. You know, it's a great opportunity for me to say, you know, to let's say, one of the nurses, Colleen, oh, I loved how, you know, your, you know, whatever the communication or the interaction was. Um, and then we sort of pick up where people feel, well, I feel maybe I didn't do this. And then you can kind of make them feel better or, or give some contextual clues and kind of have that more, what most people I think would say would be a fairly intense <laughs> interaction of caring for a patient, a lot of moving parts. Um, we had a debrief a little while ago, or a few months back, in the medical student. It was her first shift, sort of as a clinical clerk. And afterwards, she's just like, she's like, "Wowie!" She's like, "That was amazing, just how everybody talked to each other." And 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 there were still things that you know we could sort of grow and learn from each other from, and talk about kind of intricacies of um, resuscitative communication and and all of that. But she's it, it just that was really powerful for me her feeling comfortable kind of saying to me at 3 a.m before we went home from our shift how powerful that was to her and again the role modeling and and the relationships that we do have in our department and to really try to nurture uh together and and i i think you know uh, other emerged departments other units you know we all we all try and and um 
you know, COVID as challenging as it has been, has also reinforced the really positive community that we try to have together. Um, uh, and so, yeah, there's there's a lot of, it doesn't, it's not very hard to find all the wonderful things. <laughs> there's just lots of challenging things trying to pull you apart at the same time. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Now, David, I want to ask you just for a couple of minutes, if you could talk about the work that you do now. You shifted towards work in the health humanities and sort of existing in that space. And I wonder if you could just talk about what that looks sure. like for you as yeah. an educator and as a practitioner. So I think uh, I, I think that, you know, as I think of, I said before, kind of writing the book and talking about the book in a few different forums kind of lit a little bit of a fire in me. Um, I think probably first and foremost, just at the bedside with trainees and role modeling um, and, and having talks after seeing patients about communication, difficult discussions, and, and talking about um, not necessarily the medicine or the procedural stuff, but the, the communication interactions. Um, I think it's probably the most common area where my life experience uh, and thinking about it and reflecting on it some more comes through on a daily basis. Um, a few colleagues and I in recent years have started a humanity and healthcare series, sort of building community where we come together um, once a month during the year uh, over Zoom and, and have a speaker. And we just talk about uh, a conversation. So, for example, one of our nurse practitioners, Valerie Cooper, her title was "Getting Comfortable Having Uncomfortable Conversations." And so, we we had uh, myself and her and other a few members from our team uh, from nursing and rehab. And one of uh, somebody who's been a patient, and and we just invite people to come and participate and put comments in the chat or ask questions and sort of evolved over the last three years. And, and that's been really great because we have conversations within our silos of, you know, emergency medicine or internal medicine or emergency nursing or, you know, what have you. Uh, but it's nice to bring, you know, cross specialties, cross disciplines, cross professions to come together be, because um, it's a much more diverse um, discussion uh, mm -hmm. and, and I, I certainly I really enjoy I really enjoy it I, I like I like telling stories I like hearing stories I like saying you know asking follow-up questions to that um, and then I've been doing a little bit of scholarship with some some other colleagues uh, at Queens and elsewhere talking about the, the doctor's person role and as we think of Ken Meds 2025 approaching what opportunities do we have um, to adapt, optimize the way we define ourselves, the way we look inwardly at ourselves. Because right now, CanMeds, it's a great framework, um, but it's really, I, I think, you know, outwardly focused. I think a lot of the wellness initiatives are contained within professionalism, which <laughs> I, I'm not sure um, that's the way uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I think there's ways going forward that there's a lot of opportunity um, to rede redefine some of that. And, and it's not what I think. I feel my, my, some of my small role is to try and encourage the conversations and bring mm -hmm. more people to the table. And, and as you said, that there are a lot of voices and equity seeking groups over the years who have not felt comfortable or been given the place mm -hmm. to have the voice um, and, and so I think that's part of the process going going forward, not just within can meds, but within our society, mm -hmm. within healthcare. Um, and then, you know, any opportunity to give a talk. I got to do a, a grief workshop two weeks ago with the child and adolescent psychiatry program here. And that was great. Like mm -hmm. I learned so much from them. I, I sort of um, just facilitated a workshop to talk about a lot of the, yeah. the things we're talking about here, but a little bit more focused on, mm -hmm. on what kind of medicine they do. Yeah. Um, and I, I just chatting and uh, I like to 
talk. And so I, I found different ways to either write. Um, and, you know, I, I read lots of your work and others work and I really enjoy, you know, taking a Sunday morning to read what you've written in the LA Times or the Globe and Mail or the Toronto <laughs> Star and kind of reflect on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'll send you a little note, um, maybe privately, maybe by Twitter um, or forward it on to a colleague and just spending a little bit more time thinking about that and how that influences my practice and maybe not on the mitochondrial DNA or other sort of nothing against the sort of medical expert therapeutic stuff because we have to know that and we have to yeah. stay current um, but just a, allowing some yeah. more space for that yeah. and some more conversations realizing that um, we have to juggle a lot of competencies and and skills um, yeah. and so yeah it's it's occupied a little bit more of my academic output and time that I've been putting into yeah. my career. Well, it's a very holistic view. And what I'm really struck by as we talk is, uh, you know, so often, um, and especially, you know, I've really seen this in all my years of working with students in particular. I think sometimes students become a mirror for ways in which we can see things that we did not do well or things that we wish we had done differently at particular points in our lives. And what I've really had the opportunity to see and that I really just experience as I listen to you as something that's kind of bloomed in your own life. When we wall off what has been the worst or the hardest or the most difficult for us personally, and we don't allow it to sort of become integrated, to interact with our practice identities and our professional identities, I think we actually increase our suffering exponentially. And I think we wall ourselves off also potentially from the best parts of ourselves, the most profound parts, the parts that can actually be in the most surprising moments of the most profound service. Yeah. So I really, I love how you've framed that. That's one of the many lessons that I see in your life and some of the wisdom that you have that just touches me the most. But I think it's really, um, your, your life is Thanks. kind of a masterclass in terms mm -hmm. of how to try to make those ends meet. I know it might not feel like that, but that's how I, well, that's how I see it. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll take all of those warm fuzzies mm -hmm. right there. Uh, thank you. It, it, yeah. It, you know, um, the imperfectly trying to be perfect. I, the one, one thing I was going to say earlier, and just as I was listening there is, you know, sometimes I think, you know, we're just all too hard on ourselves, never mind each other, but like our, our inner self talk. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think, just like whether it's with a, a close colleague, friend, um, but more importantly with ourselves to like give ourselves a little more slack and, and uh, uh, allow to bugger up the odd thing. Yeah. Um, but it never feels good in the moment. Um, and I think that's part of like growth and in, in maybe, you know, this foundational tragic circumstance that. Uh, Trish and I and and Callum siblings experience it just like it's a it's a reminder just that it's there and we're never going to be on the other side of it there's something about that reality and um, some older bereaved friends of our family that kind of told us that who are friends with our parents who have lost children it, it actually was really it was really nice to hear them say this will never You'll, you'll never be on the other side of this. It will be forever. It, it actually gave us some strength to know like, okay, that fits, that's aligned with how we feel. Yeah. That's aligned with what we think. Um, and again, like we have things happen at work, whether it be mistakes, complaints, lawsuits, bad care, social care, family stuff. You, you know, like it, it's hard to, I, I don't think we're great at, cutting ourselves a break yeah. sometimes and and um and I know I'm guilty of that too like don't don't let me pretend like I'm not but but when we talk about it as a community like me with you or me with colleagues or or we talk about it, you know within our department and have these conversations at rounds and 
informally and over coffee, I really do feel like that is what we're talking about here is kind of talking about wellness. We have challenges and stresses, but like, let's just share some stuff, share some vulnerability, see, and then you hear about so-and-so had the same thing 20 years ago or five years ago and how they dealt with it. And sometimes, you know, just hugging it out and chatting about it a bit more later um, is all we kind of really need. And somebody saying, yeah, "Yeah, don't come to the meeting tomorrow, go for a run or go do go do something for you and just skip whatever. Um, I got your back. That I think is actually that little stuff is not so little. Yeah. Um, And that's what makes me tick. So maybe that doesn't make everybody else tick, but that, that brings a lot of meaning and sort of helps me, um, you know, manage the ambitious life that I'm trying to carry out. Well, self-compassion and acceptance and trying our best to look after each other are a perfect place to end this conversation. Damon, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me virtually today. And I'm just so grateful to learn from you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's a privilege to be here. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Thanks.